If anybody has any issues with what he said, uh, take it up with Thomas. We are uh, we as a show get a grip are completely innocent. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> you put a cage on it. In a mat box, mm -hmm. the mat box is the one thing that makes a, a small camera look big and serious, right? You put yep, a mat box yep, with yep. some barn doors, and then suddenly people are like, "Whoa, that's awesome, right?" Yep. And you're like, "Yep, yeah, it's a GH5." <laughs> and I don't know who the hell did this, but they said, "You know what? We can we can use those as as we we can sell them for thirty bucks as grading plugins. You know, people are going to eat this stuff up like candy." And that's exactly what they do. Hi, everybody. In this episode, we are talking about all kinds of technical things. And to do that, we've brought on Thomas Smet from episode two. Uh, there's a lot of stuff online about which there's a ton of misinformation from camera sensors to formats to crop factor to uh, lookup tables or LUTs. So uh, join us for this episode while we get to learn all about that stuff and kind of set the record straight. Uh, Thomas, how are you doing? Good, good. How are you? I'm doing well. Uh, this is this will be a fun, uh, I think, somewhat shorter episode. Um, just to get the audience back up to speed, uh, give us your life story in a nutshell. Uh, I studied uh, video production and animation in, in college, kind of did that for about 15 years and gradually started getting more and more into graphic design and software development. So now I'm kind of working doing that, uh, still do some production here and there, not as much as I used to, but I still have a deep level of passion for all things production and post-production. All right, that's enough about you. Felipe, how are you doing? I'm doing well. I hope you don't want to know who, who I am or what I do. <laughs> I, I, at this point, I don't know anymore. <laughs> You're doing well too. It's very early for you right now, right? So people should know that you guys are waking up very early to make this happen. Yeah, we're, this is, <clears throat> excuse me, this is 7 a.m. in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Uh, Thomas, what, you were six? Yeah. In six o'clock in Colorado. Mm -hmm. uh, Felipe, this will be what? 2 p.m. for me. in the afternoon. No, 2 p.m. for you. Yeah, for all me right, it's well, great. You're, yeah. you're lucky. So I'm just waking up. Uh, all right. So. We kind of wanted to gear this conversation and, and guide it through uh, from capture to delivery. So I think one of the big pieces of information I run across all the time is that like full frame is the standard. That full frame is like the way and every other way of shooting is measured up against full frame. And I think, Thomas, I kind of want to let you run with this one because, <laughs> <laughs> well, you know the most about it, I think, uh, and technically, and you've kind of gone fisticuffs online with a number of people over the years about this issue. So I think we could maybe start by defining for the audience what full frame is, which kind of leads into sensor size and so forth. Yeah, so so full frame, when people mention that, it, it's more of the photographic form of, of a piece of 35 millimeter film. That's where that standard came from. But in the cinema world, the, the film was turned sideways because they needed to make room for the audio track. So it's actually a completely different shape, you know, for, for, for movies. And that's the way it's always been. So when people say full frame, you know, that's true in the, the photographic world, but in the, the cinema world, um, you know, the frame has always been smaller. A super 35 millimeter film is actually smaller and it's much closer to the APS-C format that we have in photography. So that's a little bit of the background there. And So for example, most of the people talking about full frame in my experience are Canon shooters and yeah. some Sony shooters. So why, mm -hmm. why, do they, why do they love full frame? Why do they think it's superior? And why do, why do they believe it's like a standard by which everything else is measured? Uh, for, for two reasons. One, because it is sort of a photographic standard and these are, uh, a lot of these cameras are, are photography cameras as well. So they kind of just assume that that, that standard carries over to all disciplines. Um, and, and the other factor is a, a depth of field and crop factor. And you know they think bigger is better and you know they have more control over shallow depth of field they have 
they get a, a wider field of view. So they assume that it's it's a better format. And, and it's sort of this marketing misconception that, well, if I have a larger frame of view, that must be the standard because everything else is smaller than it. But it's actually not true. The middle is actually technically the cinematic standard where micro four thirds goes a little bit smaller and full frame goes a little bit bigger than what the cinematic standard is. So the cinematic standard would be what, Super 35? Yeah. Okay, and so certain Blackmagic cameras, um, I'm shooting with the Panasonic GH5 right now with a Metabone speed booster, which is giving me a super 35 millimeter <clears throat> field of view. Correct. So this, this, this frame with this lens is basically going to measure up with what you would put on a Hollywood camera with those cine lens. It's exactly the same. It should be exactly the same field of view. Field uh, of view, depth of field, everything is virtually exactly the same. Okay, and that's exactly why I went this route, because I wanted a sort of a barometer to measure. So if I put on this lens on this camera, is this the field of view that I'm used to seeing in movies and so forth? It doesn't make any difference to anybody else, but to me it's just kind of a setting a baseline for myself, which is why I went that route. But as far as full-frame cameras, to be fair, what are some of the benefits of the full frame sensor? Uh, you know, some of them th that I just mentioned, you get a, a wider field of view. Not necessarily, but for a given lens, you'll get a wider field of view. If you slap a 24 millimeter lens on, on three different size cameras, full frame is going to give you a wider field of view than an APS-C super 35 millimeter or a micro four third camera. That's, that, that's a given. But, you know, different systems have different options for lenses so that that's not always absolutely true. For example, Micro Four Thirds, it's pretty common to get insanely wide lenses, like seven millimeter lenses are pretty common in Micro Four mm -hmm. Thirds. So you can, for the most part, 95% of the time, get the same field of view that you can get with full frame. If you're okay. using the same exact lens, well then sure, full frame is going to be wider, but you have options. Uh, the other one is depth of field. Uh, for those people that are obsessed with extreme shallow depth of field full frame gives you a faster path an easier path to get to that doesn't mean it's the only way the only option you have to get to it because again micro four thirds has has very wide lenses that can take can kind of match the same characteristics for depth of field plus micro four third lenses tend to look a little bit better wide open so a lot That's of full true. frame lenses only look the best at f4 f5.6 Whereas micro four third lenses sometimes will look really good wide open at f1.8, or in some cases, some lenses look phenomenal even at 1.2, like some of the Olympus Pro lenses, okay. which, which is unheard of on full frame lenses. So, you know, and, and there, there's that correlation between f stop and, and sensor size, and they kind of all balance out. So if, if you can use f1.2 on micro four thirds with great clarity and contrast, well, you're suddenly at the exact same depth of field that full frame can get with a, you know, f4.0 lens. Yeah, and well, another thing that I know about full frame is just because it's a larger sensor, just the physics of it, it means it gathers more light. So it would it, be a better performing low light mm -hmm. camera, or is that depends on the resolution too, right? Depends because on the resolution too, right? Because yeah, that's the amount of yeah. pixels that are there, the photosites. Yeah, it, 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 that, that's also a huge misconception that sensor size automatically equals sensitivity, but it actually has absolutely nothing to do with it. The only thing that matters is pixel density on the sensor. So how many pixels are packed into that, in, into that sensor? So, you know, full frame sensors are larger, yes, which would make you think that it would have, you know, larger pixels that can capture more light but they also tend to have more megapixels. So a full frame camera might be 32 megapixels or, or, or you're in some cases higher, whereas micro four third camera is 16 megapixels. Now like GH5 is 20, but you know, they, they, they kind of balance each other out. And then, you know, one of the reasons why the GH5S is much better in low light is because it gets rid of all the, the wasted pixels that, that you would use in photography normally. And, get, and gives you larger pixels to the point where it's pretty much as sensitive as an APS-C sensor. And then okay. once, you, once you throw on, a, you know, like a Metabone speed booster, you pretty, are, pretty much are up to full frame level sensitivity because it does have larger pixels. So, so the, the, there is sort of that misconception as well that, well, I have a larger sensor, it's more sensitive. Not necessarily. 
you know, typically, yes, that, that is the case, but it also depends on the density. Okay. And so we've already talked about different sensor sizes, micro four thirds, APS-C, Super 35, full frame. And I mentioned when I put a certain lens on my camera with a speed booster, it gives me a certain field of view that I can measure up against, say, how most Hollywood movies that I'm familiar with look like. Yeah. But if I put that same lens on a different camera, it's going to look different. And that is about crop factor. And that's a whole new, that's a whole different can of worms that I know you, you'd like to get into. But b before we do, uh, and I think we've slightly started to define it already in the episode, but how would you define crop factor for the audience? Well, the, the, what the crop factor is, is it, it's sort of a, a weird name that came from sort of that full frame world where they think, well, if it's something smaller, then it must be cropped. And what they crop means like you're taking the full view and you're only taking a small middle portion of it. And that's kind of what they mean by crop factor. But it, 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 it only really makes sense if you're, if you're comparing it to some sort of a larger format system. So if, if you're a person that only thinks in full frame terms, then you know crop factor might make sense. Or if you're someone who's a filmmaker and, and typically works in, in only super 35 millimeter, you know, then using a micro four thirds camera could end up having a crop factor. There are so many different formulas to determine what your crop factor is. And the reason yeah. they do that is because they, well, because people want to measure up against some other system for, for whatever reason. But why? You know, well, talk about that. I mean, people want to do it because they're, <laughs> because they're led to believe that they need to do that. But why are we led to believe that we need to measure up against another system? Because I know, I mean, you're here because you know way more about this uh, technically than I do. And I was shooting micro four thirds and then I was going to get the speed booster, which was going to change my field of view. And I kept trying to compare it to see like, how was it comparing to micro four thirds, but all the comparisons were measuring against full frame. And it took a while, uh, probably an annoying amount of time for you to keep explaining to me that like, <laughs> why you can't measure it against this because this system's irrelevant for what you're seeing. Like, how do you break that down for people? Well, you know, the, the, the community has way overcomplicated this, this subject to the point of, of, of lunacy where people try to add all this math to it and come up with these perfect numbers, you know, like, well, well if you use this, you're going to have a 1.86 crop factor. No person thinks like that. And you shouldn't have to think like that. All that really matters is the, the shot that you can frame for the system you're on. You know, if, if you're using a micro four thirds camera, who cares what that lens looks like on a different system? You know, unless you're shooting a micro four thirds camera next to a super 35 millimeter camera on a set and you need to match those in some way, you know, it, it's really irrelevant. Okay. You know, you know, j just get familiar with with the system you're using. If you're if you're strictly using micro four thirds, it really doesn't matter what the crop factor is. That, that's the last thing you should be thinking about. You should be thinking about when I use a 24 millimeter lens on my camera I get this kind of shot that I prefer over a different lens. And then you kind of develop your own methods of, of, of what lens is appropriate for different scenarios. Like if you want to have more of a compressed background or less, you know, don't worry about other systems. You're, you're just overcomplicating the entire process of what lens works best for certain situations. That makes and, sense. you know, and, and, and another thing is, is it, you, full frame is an easy thing to calculate for because it's a, it's a single standard. It comes from the photography world. But super 35 millimeter, there really is no standard. And, and if you look at every single cinema camera on the market, not a single one uses the exact same size sensor. You know, some of them are, are slightly off, but there really is no standard. I mean, it's roughly 1.5 crop factor compared to full frame, but some of them are 1.4, some of them are 1.6. You know, the, the, the Ari Alexa actually has multiple shooting modes where you end up having a different crop factor depending on, on which mode you select. So even with that, that single camera, you could end up having like four or five different crop factors, depending on what format you decide to shoot in. Okay. So it, so the, this whole crop factor thing and trying to calculate it is completely irrelevant. All, all you need to know is what lenses work well with your particular camera. 
unless you're doing some weird visual effects stuff where you need to match move you know a 3d environment sure. to a real world environment you need to get everything matched perfectly well, uh, actually at that point there are there are lenses like the new Zeiss. i forgot what's the model they actually have uh, an electronic component on the lens that you connect directly to your computer and the lens records all the metadata of the the the, fo uh, the focal length and the where the focus wheel was and how the camera is moving so you can send that back to vfx for example it's something nice. that is very new but for example you can connect that to an external controller and it records on the controller and soon they're trying to make that record directly into the red file so this is something that Zeiss is doing together with red as well um, very nice yeah, it's actually That's very cool. cool. But but That's again, pretty cool. But again, it's like uh, you're not going to be comparing that lens with any other lens with any other camera, right? You're like, oh, there is a subject that's two meters away, and I want them to look like uh, they are farther. So you need to be wider. So then you you need to think about the lens for that camera, for that for the system that you have, right? You're not thinking about, yeah. oh. I would use a 14 mil on a full frame, but then because I'm on this red that has the sensor like this, and you're not going to be calculating like that. No, no one, no one in their right mind would do that. I think. I hope. Yeah. Well, I've, and, I've but, but 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 the sad thing is, is there are a ton of people out there doing it, and that's why they worry about crop factor. You know, they they'll they'll, they'll take a micro four thirds camera, but the entire time they're only thinking of how that lens works on a full frame camera. And it's like, why, you know, learn what that lens does on that particular camera. Don't, don't worry about it. You're just overcomplicating it. Well, and I think that a lot of people who, uh, and I'm thinking specifically about micro four thirds, people who take these smaller sensor and often smaller camera body cameras, even though that's like, maybe that's all they could afford, or maybe they were told that's the route they should go, but they're still, I think, comparing it often to larger cameras, larger sensor cameras, larger form factor cameras, which leads me to another thing I've come across, which is that if you show up on location with a tiny camera, people aren't going to take you seriously, that your client will laugh at you. I've never encountered that, but I read about it a lot. What, yeah. How do you guys feel about that? Well, I personally, I, I've seen that happening uh, to me. Uh, but that would depend on if it's a major, major client, correct? Who's used to larger broadcast type cameras? Yes, and it was exactly okay. that case. Um, but I think if, if you're worried about the size of your camera and how a, a client will react, it's actually very interesting to, to give them options. Uh, there is this camera, it's bigger, it's more expensive. Uh, but now with this bigger camera, I can't be moving around that easily as for the shoots that you want. So for that shoot, I need something lighter. I'm not gonna, uh, I'm not gonna make your the quality of the video any worse. It's just that there is the right equipment for the the right situation. Now a lot of people only use one camera, and they might go to a big client like maybe a, an auto company, and they need to shoot that new car and etc. And uh, if they're expecting red and you come with a GH5, yeah, sure, they're going to look at you weird uh, because they had one expectation, but you kind of never set the expectation before. Now, on the other hand, you can, you, you can always like make, uh, uh, do a makeup on your, like Brad said, put the lipstick on a pig. You're still using your GH5, but if you put a cage on it in a matte box, mm -hmm. the matte box is the one thing that makes a, a small camera look big and serious, right? You put yep, a matte yep, box yep, with yep. some barn doors and then suddenly people are like, whoa, that's awesome, right? Yep. And you're like, yep, yeah. it's GH5. <laughs> You know, I I bought one for my GH4, and it's the coolest darn thing I've ever put on that camera. It's pretty much useless, but it sure does look cool. It's like getting a 7200. You put a 7200 on a camera because now it's uh -huh. bigger. It looks more serious. Now put the the sun hood on the lens. It looks even more serious. Never happened to you yeah. this thing. It never happened to to you this thing of, of of size of the camera then, Gabe. Well, one time I showed up on a shoot, and the client was like, "Oh, the camera's so small." Uh, <laughs> But did they yeah. bitch about how it looked when I gave, when I delivered the finished video? No, because I think most people who aren't in the industry don't know what cameras are capable of these days. No, they, no, they, I mean, they, they don't, don't know that this little $2,000 
I mean, I, I also have the cage and the rig and the XLR. I've got a lot of other money bolted onto it, uh, more for functionality than looks. But this $2,000 camera is outproducing like what our best cameras could do 10 years ago. And people don't realize that, I don't think. Um, but there are... There are some advantages to larger form factor cameras. Of course. Uh, dedicated physical knobs versus mm -hmm. having to dial into menus. Uh, yeah. A little bit more stable for movement just because of the sheer weight of them. Uh, and then some of the downsides would be less mobile. Mm -hmm. uh, they'd take more power, so on and so forth. But is there any, apart from like you, Felipe, where a client, uh, say a, somebody hires you to do a, a big television commercial, you probably wouldn't show up with a GH5 for that. Although I think things are changing. There are some commercials that have at a least lot of used people do. GH5s on SB cams. But apart from the, if we skip the perception and expectation aside, how, <clears throat> how much of a difference do you think it makes, assuming that these cameras are used by people who know what they're doing, between shooting a GH5 and a RED as far as final product? It's all about the person, about the person. I mean, yeah, is it? It's more the shooter than the actual camera, correct? Absolutely. It it it, yes. it, re it really depends on the the production value of the crew. You know, I mean, you you can get the same results out of those two cameras if you put a lot of time and care into a shoot. Um, you know, the 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 advantages to the larger cameras are ergonomics, and they're a little bit more forgiving in difficult yeah. situations sometimes. More dynamic range. Yeah, maybe a little which, bit more which, low which light is more or less. Yeah, which is more or less things that are more forgiving. They give you more options later on. Whereas with, with a GH5, you know, you kind of need to nail exposure, you know, properly on set. You, you want to make sure you nail your color on set. You know, you want to not move it too much because it's a smaller, lighter camera unless you have, you know, really good stabilization gear. You know, the, you know, there's just things you have to be careful of. You know, you can't quickly switch controls because a lot of it is through menus. Yeah. Um, you know, so it's it, it it's all about comfort and ergonomics and how much flexibility you have later on. Okay. So that's where things like raw would come in, recording raw. Yeah. Because it gives you the raw sensor data and you can push that you have a lot more latitude to push that image in post, uh for grading or stretching out dynamic range or compressing it and so forth. Absolutely. Yeah, you know, it's okay. a, the the same thing with ten bit and eight bit formats. It's really about how much flexibility you have later on. You know, visually we, we can't really see the difference between those formats in most situations. And yeah, let's, so let's, let's properly, let's switch over and properly talk <laughs> about formats right now. Um, so I'm recording this episode in four, it's color space 4208 bit. For a lot of my client work, I do color space 422 10-bit. Um, but even that's overkill in my opinion for a lot of what I do. <clears throat> Thomas? Mr. Tech Guy, can you explain to the audience <laughs> without without getting too mathy? It's very what, mathy, but <laughs> well, four two zero. Say four, you know, four two zero, four two two, four 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 four. Uh, yeah. What does that mean as far as color space, and then the, and then separately the bit depth, eight, ten, twelve. Yes. Yeah, so so there there's sort of this misconception that that they're like absolutely horrible quality. But really, all those the the chroma subsampling is for like four two zero. It's just the ratio of of color to luminance pixels or black and white pixels, and that that's that's how video was has always been separated uh, for 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 Rec seven hundred nine type video or, or typical video formats. Is they separate the color channels and they separate the black and white, and, and that's they, because. That's, we're much Be more sensitive to luminance changes correct. than color, yeah. correct? And so yeah. the 420, 422, it's because they're throwing away unnecessary color information, correct? Yep, yep. Yeah, and, and they realized early on that if you get rid of color but not the detail of a shot, that we really cannot see it. We visually don't really notice it very well. So so that's why those formats exist. But really, the only the only difference is the size of the pixels. That's how I like to think of it. So if you have 444, then let, let's say you have a grid of two by two pixels, then every single one of those is, is unique. If you have okay. 420, your color pixels are the size of two by two pixels. So that little grid of two by two is one color instead of four separate little colors. That, that's really the only difference. Or, so sampling, or if, sampling is pulling in or sampling less <clears throat> information. Yeah, yeah. It's, 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 it's like having an image half the size or half the resolution. 
So, so a, a, another simple way to think of it, if you have 4K that's 420, your luminance is is 3840 by 2160 pixels, but your 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 chroma channels are 1920 by 1080 pixels. So you still one, have one full quarter. HD oh. resolution for for your your chroma channels, which is really good. I mean, there's a lot of movies that are still 2K resolution. You know, so y- y- even with the what people consider the horrible you know, 4K, 420 formats, you still have a ton of color information there. It's not as much as the luminance information, but it's still full HD. And, and it's worth probably mentioning also the, the Bayer uh, pattern on, on, on a sensor tree, right? Because when you're talking about yep. uh, <clears throat> you have this resolution for luminance and then you have this smaller resolution for color, from that, half of it is green. And then 25 is red and 25 is blue. Well, yeah, can you, yeah. Can, what can you define what a Bayer pattern is for some of the viewers who don't know? I could, but I think I think Thomas is better at that than me. <laughs> yeah, so so the, the the way a single sensor camera works is is there's no such thing as separate color channels, so they had to pack the pixels up they're alternated. So you have one green pixel, then one blue, and then one red. Okay. You know, or or, or pattern similar to that. And, and what happens is if you have a 4K camera that, that's a single sensor that uses a Bayer pattern, you know, it, it has to take all those different colored pixels and create new pixels based on the average of those together. So, okay. w- so when we shoot with every single one of our cameras or if you shoot with red or even the, 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 the Area Alexa, Every single one of those image is a mathematically interpolated image based on what the sensors okay. are. Okay. Because it, it does an average. So it takes it takes two green pixels and a red and a blue, sort of like in a in that two pixel by two pixel grid. And it takes those and it averages them together and says, Okay, here's your green value for that two by two block, here's your, your blue value, and here's your red value. And that's so based it, on it's, luminance, it's, right? Yeah, it's 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 based on all of it. It'll it'll calculate all of it together you know so there's there's a little bit more green fidelity on a bare sensor than red and blue and and but, the reason why there are more green is because we are more sensitive to green right yes yeah but but the but but like you were saying Philippe is is that you know there's really yes you have a 444 image with a single sensor camera but it's nowhere near the accuracy of of like a three chip camera used to be when we still had three chip cameras in the world. There are still a couple, but you know, because because that what you're getting is interpolated image. It's a softer image. Everything is kind of mushed together. There's no such thing as pure pixel accuracy when when you're dealing with those type of images. Now it's a different type of alignment between how the the samples and the colors line up, but. And, but and, yeah, you're, and probably you're not worth really mentioning missing much. And probably worth mentioning that this Bayer pattern, like what the raw value of that is, the normal cameras like a GH5, a GH4, all the Sony cameras, if you're recording internally, you're actually getting the camera to interpret all of that and spit you out uh, its interpretation of how this should look. Whereas yeah. when you're recording raw, you're recording straight out of the sensor one by one what the the photo sites are are capturing right so to or, or if you're recording a log if you're recording a log it's like the next best thing to to raw but it, but it has been interpolated already it went from yeah, linear to logarithmic and it, it's been interpreted already it's been interpreted but there's less in camera processing than yeah. a baked in look uh, but more certainly than it, yeah yeah it, it does a roll off of the highlights right it's what it does. Yeah. It's what it yeah, does. It, it's it, it, it's kind of a log is like an in between. I mean, it's not quite raw because it's not raw, but it strips out a lot of that baked in processing, so you can still do a lot with it in post. Yeah, no noise reduction. As, yeah, as, I mean, as I mean, I it, it it doesn't have as much of the color baked in. Doesn't have as much of the contrast baked in. So you can push it a lot further than than a, a traditional image would. You would be able to. And because log formats should be in 10 bit, you know, that gets well, you it, that much more latitude as well. And you say push it. So we, we talked about a while ago how 
re recording 420, say, versus 422, perceptibly, most people can't even notice a difference. So when you say pushing it, uh, that uh, that's post production, right? That's yeah, yeah. Sorry, I'm, having I'm extra data, having extra data to deal with in post that you can push it beyond the state at which it was recorded, right? Because mm -hmm. that extra mm -hmm. data gives you that breathing room, and so that would be the benefit of recording that extra data. Because if we can't yeah. see it, there there has to be some reason for it. So I would yeah. argue if you are if you are shooting for what your output image is like, meaning you're not going to process it in post. What's the harm in recording 420 then? There is no harm at all. Exactly. There is no harm at all. Uh, the other thing that I wanted just to mention on the on the raw part, just stepping back a little, is that because the camera already interpreted everything when, when you recorded your compressed image format, be that log or any other um, profile that you have on your camera, uh, that image will not get any better with the passage of time. Whereas a raw image, be that for photos or for, uh, for video, what is transforming that, that Bayer pattern? So what is doing the debayering and what is doing the transformation from linear to any other format or keeping linear is the computer. The computer will be the one doing the debayering. So for example, if you get a red raw and you put it on your computer, uh, the, the application is doing the debayering and is doing all the calculations, all the averages, everything that needs to be done is done on the computer. Now, in 10 years from now, maybe you're going to have better algorithms. We're going to have better everything. So you look at the same raw recording from 10 years ago and tomorrow will look better than it looked five years ago. If there was that yes. advancement in algorithmic calculation and debayering and things like that, so sure, because the the camera is the fixed data point. Yeah. But if the if if the tools we use to debayer that and interpret that are changing and advancing over time, you can take that same raw, <laughs> you can take that same raw information and better better update that down the road. So yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. For, versus yeah. me t taking this image I'm recording right now, four two zero eight bit. Uh, the, it's all baked in. So five years down the road, it's still a four two zero eight bit. And it's gonna no tool is gonna give me more flexibility than what I have today. Yeah. So that makes sense. Yeah. Um, so it, it it all goes back to flexibility again. It's and that's really what it's about. And, and I would argue that's the same thing for audio recording. Yep. Uh, you know, for, there's, there's a standard for recording audio and video is you know twenty four bit forty eight kilohertz, mm -hmm. and a lot of recorders can record up to 96 kilohertz. I think some can even do 128. Um, that's overkill, as far as I'm concerned, unless you're doing, again, a lot of processing and post. Yeah. Having that extra information in there gives you more flexibility to manipulate the sound. So it's the same exact thing for video. It's just about data itself. Absolutely. Years ago, when, I was, when the transition from analog to digital, digital was coming into being, I don't remember where I learned this, but if you think of an analog curve, like an analog wave in nature that's smooth, the digital world is simply assigning a bunch of dots to that curve to redraw mm -hmm. that curve. And if that curve is drawn with a small number of dots, you end up with a jagged, crude approximation of nature. The more dots you have, the more you replicate nature. And with enough dots in there, it becomes the human eye and the brain can't tell the difference between the digital and the natural signal. I'm not yep. quite sure we're, we're fully there yet, but it seems to me that sort of analogy applies to bit depth and and then color space would kind of be that in like three dimensions with color. Yeah. But it's the more information you have, you know, you're talking about, you know, the two by two squares. So uh, 420 that has color, or 444 that has color in every square is a curve with a ton of dots on it. So yep. it's a very smooth approximation. Whereas if they're if you're throwing out that information, you get a more jagged curve. Yep, and we might absolutely. buy the jagged curve, but if you put that jagged curve into a an editing program and start to push that color, that that's where those jagged edges start to really poke out and, yeah, and yeah. harm the and, image. And, and and just like that that curve, the higher resolution we go in video, the less important having the the four 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 actually is. So like when, Expl when we were in that quickly. Uh, so when we had standard definition and, and we had like a 420 format, it, it was pretty bad because each pixel is pretty huge to begin with in standard mm -hmm. definition. So when you reduce that even more and then you watch it on a large screen TV, you know, you, you've got some pretty obvious, ugly, you know, color blocks. 
in there. We're, we're already when we moved to, to HD, you know, a lot of those issues kind of disappeared to the point where a lot of people were starting to to pull keys off of HD material, even if, if it was 420, and they had a tremendously easier time doing it. And they got some, some excellent results from it. By pulling keys, you're talking about uh, like green screen or blue screen footage, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah, Where for that. The, the more, you know, for example, if we all have short hair, but say I had long flowing blonde hair, uh, let's, let's, I don't like that. Let's, we'll go with Felipe has long flowing blonde hair. <laughs> of course. Uh, and, and he's in front of a green screen. Um, you'd want to, you need to remove that green when it's going to be really tricky with all these fine hairs. So but, the but, more but, color information uh, you have, the easier it is to pull that, right? But you can still do it because the luminance information is still there in the hairs. So it yeah. really depends on the color. I mean, you could get jagged edges, but you know, you'll, you'll still probably get those hairs. Okay, but now, that's what you now, mean by pulling a key is yeah, just chrome yeah. a key. Yeah, and, 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 and once we move to 4K, you know, it's just like that curve with the audio. You know, you, you're talking about such fine, tiny little dots or pixels that it's really difficult now to tell the difference between 444 and 420. Well, sure, you know, if I raised my arm in Photoshop and, and it was <clears throat> the resolution was low, this... There's never really a curve unless it's a vector file. So you would, yeah. you would see little little steps. But if the pixels are smaller, they're even tinier steps, small enough yep. where it a, appears to be a curve. Yeah. It's so so the so the the higher we go, the the less relevant this actually is. You know, and and, and on paper, people always talk about well, that, well, that that's crap. You know, it's four two zero. We can't use that. But but that's more of a psychological effect because the reality is, you know, in in visual effects in movies, when, when they were at 2K, and a lot of movies still are 2K, even visual effects movies, you know, e even though those are 444, those are still only, you know, 2K resolution of color pixels. Whereas if you have 4K video, sure, the luminance is higher, but you still have the same color information that, that movies did when they had 2K at 444. So okay. we, we, we have just as much information now as Hollywood has ever had to, to work with movies. And That's so, you know, we, we shouldn't really think, you know, these formats are horrible. The, the image compression side of it, I agree, could be better. But, but the chroma subsampling thing, it's, it's not really as bad as people think it is. There, there's this, there's, that's one of the biggest misconceptions I see in the world. They, 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 they hear the word 420 and they think garbage. You know, they think it just looks like absolute trash. But it's typically all the other compression that comes along with that. All right. So we talked about color and you just mentioned uh, Hollywood movies. There are these things called lookup tables or LUTs, L-U-T. And they can be applied while during capture and also in post. And what it basically is, is a way of a, applying a, a look to your footage, either baking mm -hmm. it in and capture or, or applying it in post. And one of the things I find that people do all the time is they just, they shoot their image, they slap on a LUT and say, <laughs> now it's Hollywood. Now my movie's like Hollywood. Yeah. Why do they do that? And is that, explain to the audience what a LUT is, first of all, and then how one applies it during capture versus post, and then when it might be an appropriate route versus say manually grading or manipulating your image versus relying on a lot or do you do both do you apply a lot and grade an image is that, is that too much to unpack <laughs> who, who, <laughs> just who, like, uh, oh, who, oh, who are uh, you asking <laughs> definitely not me <laughs> so uh, a, a, a lot which i like to call a lame uninspired treatment um as my nickname for it okay. um it, it's it's really just a grading preset is what it is. You know, the p people think LUTs are magic. They're not. They're 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 not intelligent. They're not magic. It's it, it's it, it's basically the same as if you went into you know Final Cut or, or Premiere and you did a grade on something and you saved it so you could put it on on another on 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 all your other clips in your timeline. That's basically what a LUT is. It's saying, I want to push the green this way. I want to push the red this way, the blue this way. 
adjust the contrast in the in the in the brightness and i mean it, it's got a lot more precision in it because it's a giant table of data so, so that's basically what it is if you can think of it like an excel spreadsheet it's just a giant table of all these different little attributes and points that you can push and pull around and 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 adjust but at the end of the day that's all it is it's it's like if you went into premiere or final cut and and you adjust a couple color sliders and then you're like okay i like that look i'm going to slap that on all my other clips and i'm going to copy and paste that effect across them that's basically what a lut is well no i know i'm aware that there are generally two different kinds of LUTs. You know, in the Final Cut Pro system, they call it a camera LUT and then a creative LUT. Um, but really, it just means we mentioned They're the shooting same raw thing. or log earlier. Well, the, yeah, but they are applied differently. So for example, if you're recording a yeah, log they're, footage, they're it's going to look grayscale yeah. because all the, the image is compressed and there's not a lot of color information uh, visible in there. And so you apply a lot to bring that back into like a Rec 709 yes. or broadcast space versus once you're already in that space, then you apply a lot to maybe make it look like Save It Private Ryan or something like that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so they're, they're, they're the same exact thing, but, but they're labeled as a corrective LUT in in a in more of a look based LUT, and what okay. the the corrective LUTs are is they're designed specifically for like a log format. So like like Sony has their own log formula, Canon has their own, Panasonic has their own. Everyone has their own their own log formula. So a corrective LUT is typically made by manufacturers, but a lot of third party people make them as well because they don't like the manufacturer ones. So like, well, I think I can do this better and come mm -hmm. up with a better out of camera look for it. So then I you think take those corrective LUTs. Yeah, then the, you apply that corrective LUT and it basically gets your log footage to a normal kind of a look. Okay, so basically it, if you hadn't shot log, if you had shot like a natural standard profile, yeah. that LUT kind of brings you up to that baseline. Yeah, well, while but you still, still maintaining, to yeah, push you, you still maintain some of the benefits like the higher dynamic range to a certain degree. Because once you add contrast, you destroy dynamic range. Sure, that's true. But so, so many people are just slapping it on and advertising it as like make your movie look like Hollywood. Is <laughs> doesn't that kind of cheapen all the work that goes into Hollywood? Because most of what Hollywood is doing is uh, in front of the camera. It's what the camera captures. Most of the Hollywood look isn't doesn't have much to do with the camera itself at all. So uh, how do you well, how, how you do know, we break that down? The, the reason why LUTs are so popular, and it's the reason why a lot of look plugin packages have been popular for years is gradients are pretty complex art and science. And it's very difficult for a lot of people to master. A, a lot of people can grade stuff. They can push things around and be like, hey, look, I made this look a little bit better, blah, blah, blah. But to master it takes a lot of time, talent, and skill to do. So, you know, and, and a lot of people that want to get into filmmaking, you know, they want to tell stories. They want to, you know, put a story together, you know, through editing, but they don't necessarily want to grade because it's, it can be a very tedious process. It, it's sort of like painting, you know, a, a touching up photos in Photoshop for a photographer, you know, it can be a very tedious process. You kind of have to do it sometimes, but sure would be nice if I could just have a one click plugin in, in Photoshop to do that to my photos. That's kind of what LUTs or, or look plugins in, in general are doing is they're taking that more complex sort of thing and giving people a one click solution to be like hey i would there's no way i could ever grade my footage to look like all these different cool looks so i can just apply this thing and boom look i have something that looks like saving private ryan or some other movie okay so there are uh lazy ways of applying them that's and that's also, exactly what LUTs are. But, well, but 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 LUTs were not designed for that purpose. They were designed so if if you're on a professional shoot and you're shooting in log or or raw or some other format, you could create a lookup table to add to a, a monitor that's on set. So yeah. so so the DP could come up with what the look of that TV series is going to be. So whenever anyone is shooting that the episode of that show or that movie, you know, on different sets or so on, when when everyone's looking at it on that big monitor on the set, 
they know kind of what that look is going to look like. Versus and, and looking at a washed out grayscale image. Yeah, exactly. So, I mean, that that's what LUTs were kind of designed for. And then I don't know who the hell did this, but they said, you know what, we can, we can use those as, as we, we can sell them for 30 bucks as grading plugins. You know, people are going to eat this stuff up like candy. And that's exactly what they do. Yeah, I've, I've uh, dabbled in that. LUTs are awesome, but they're, they're you know, uh, going back to that whole thing where they're not intelligent or they're not magic, you have to be really careful when you use them because they assume the exact same base point every on every single shot. So if if you are not, you know, using absolute strict production value and white balancing and exposing with with a eighteen percent gray card every single shot perfectly. You're going to get different results when you put that LUT on every single one of your shots. Because LUTs all expect a specific input exactly. level, right? Yep. They, they don't expect remain the, consistent. Yep. They expect the same baseline input level for every single shot. So if, if, you, if you got 10 shots in your timeline, every single one has a very slightly different white balance, very slightly different exposure because, you know, what, I'm just going to eat TTR this whole thing and, and not use an 18% gray card then every single shot's going to look different. How many weddings have you shot where you've came back and found that every single shot has the exact same dynamic range and the exact same exposure? Not just weddings, pretty much everything. I mean, So you've you never know, shot anything where every shot is exactly the same across the board? I, it's something I want I, I to haven't. get to the point <laughs> to do, but you can't hold an 18% gray card in front of every single shot every time you move the camera. It's, it's unrealistic. Uh, some productions do, you well, know, they're the, the kind of productions where, where where they take two hours to get one shot and then they move the whole camera and crew to a different And you have setup. one person just for that, actually. <laughs> exactly. Yes. Yeah. Well, that, that comes down to crew size. You know, we, we are all three of us with rare exception are shooting by ourselves. And so, yeah, it's so much to do. But when you've got a Hollywood or a broadcast environment where there are dedicated people doing specific things, it's much easier to exactly replicate and mathematically yeah. place things and set things up so that you can achieve that exact yep. same exposure level. That's why they have light meters and all this other stuff. Exactly, you know. exactly. Now, if, if you correct every single shot first in post in your timeline, so you make sure the exposure and the white balance are perfect across every shot, well, then the LUT will give you more consistent results, but I Which, really don't think a lot of people are doing that. But that is the recommended workflow because that, that would yes. be basically color correcting first, which is just making sure everything looks yep. consistent. Then you apply the look to, yes. the, to the video. But, but, it, but it's important that people that use LUTs are, are aware of that, that they need to be doing that. You, well, know, you can't just slap the LUT on there and be like, hey, look what I made. Isn't that sexy? Well, I would argue you can because people do it all the time. And that's why I brought it up in this episode. I know. It's just one all of right. those things, you know. All right, so we've talked about uh, from capture with crop factor and sensor size and full frame to recording formats and lookup tables. A uh, lot of technical information that is kind of branded about online by people who don't know what they're talking about or who only have half the story. Um, Thomas has spent a lot of time researching this stuff, and I get to hear about it a lot. <laughs> and I, 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 I jump in where I can. Uh, all I can really do is take what he's told me and see if it uh, coincides with my experience when I'm actually shooting and editing, and so far it, it does. So if anybody has any issues with what he said, uh, take it up with Thomas. We are uh, we as a show, Get a Grip, are completely innocent. So, uh, <laughs> leave it in the comments, because if anything he said is slightly, if he missed a good point, or if we, if we failed to mention something related to these topics, uh, Write about it in the comments because we want to know about it. That's the only way to dispel this misinformation that's spewing all over the internet. Uh, Felipe, do you have anything to add? You've been kind of quiet this episode because I know uh, I kind of gave this to the Wizard of Oz here, Thomas. <laughs> but. Yeah, no, it totally makes sense. I mean, uh, there is nothing that I disagree, really, because all of those things are facts. 
And uh, as long as people know the facts and how things work, I think uh, we as an industry, we're going to work a lot better. Uh, and we're going to have a lot of misinformation or a lot less misinformation uh, out there. I, I mean, really, Thomas, thank you for coming here and having the patience of going what it is, 420, what it is, 422. <laughs> and, and going through all of those things. Now, we just talked about the capture part of, of things. We still have to talk about uh, the post-production. So that's going to be uh, part number two of that, which I hope everyone's going to be here to watch. But otherwise, please like, subscribe to this uh, here. If you are listening to this on, on podcast on iTunes, just the audio version, we have a video version on YouTube. So please check that out. You just look for Get a Grip and you should be fi- able to find us. Uh, leave comments as we know, uh, or don't, whatever. <laughs> and from it, that's all. All right, guys. Well, thanks for joining us. Uh, Thomas, thank you again for uh, jumping on. Uh, we will record this second parter at some point in the not too distant future so thanks everybody thank you bye bye